because that's, you see, nature works with very low energies. Uh, DNA can make anything, and there's no smelting, no huge release of toxic uh, byproducts. And, uh, and the amazing thing about these proteins is that the ribosome stamps them out, and they come out in like a line, but they have forces, electrostatic and other kinds of forces, uh, scripted into them so that they fold in very, very complicated ways. And they always fold the same way and their memory of how to fold where this comes from is one of the great uh, mysteries of molecular biology it's not at all understood well imagine if we could make machines which just uh, emerged as a strange form of spaghetti which then folded itself into jet planes refrigerators automobiles color television sets uh, lipstick cases and what have you this has to do with my notion that uh, really the next evolutionary leap is, uh, well, I shouldn't call it an evolutionary leap because it's a leap in epigenetic development, but is what I call the genesis of visible language, that there is an ability just under the surface of human organization waiting to be coaxed out either through yoga or slight genetic engineering or something like that. And it is uh, something that was anticipated by the Alexandrine philosopher Philo Judaeus. He talked about the Logos, and which is this teaching voice, this informing thing which is heard. And he was interested in what he called the more perfect Logos. And he said, what is the more perfect logos? And then he answered his own question and said, it would be a, a logos which went from being heard to being beheld without ever crossing over a, a border of transition. In other words, a form of synesthesia. Well, uh, using ayahuasca and DMT and compounds like this, which are very closely related to our ordinary brain chemistry, and practice and dedication, you can begin to explore places where a vocal synesthesia becomes a colored topological manifold. And you can communicate, you can show someone your thoughts by singing in such a way as to condense visible objects into the air in front of them. And these objects are, they are hyper words. They are words which you don't hear but which you see. And they are, and like objects, they have sides and facets and can be rotated and examined from all sides. Well, now the biases in our language that cause us to say things like, I see what you mean, when we mean I understand you fully, shows that we really place a greater emphasis on seeing the truth than on hearing the truth. So the truth seen is somehow more valid than truth heard. And uh, ayahuasca is a perfect example of a plant which communicates with a visible language. The mushroom, you often hear it, and often the hearing evolves into a, a visible synesthetic field of, uh, of photonic input, but the ayahuasca always communicates visually, and it's like the Mayan glyphs or something. It's this fantastically complicated surface which is conveying alien meaning. After an ayahuasca trip, you just feel like your eyes are sticking out of your head because you've just been looking as one looks at the page of a book for hours and hours as this strange uh, alien uh, three-dimensional language flows through your mind. But I believe that this is a human ability just under the surface and that in psychedelic states of mind this happens to people. This is why all the fiddling with glossolalia. It's in the hope of reaching, you know, that concordance of chemistry and the moment that will allow this to happen because it's for some reason 
very satisfying. It's like an utterly harmless city. It seems to have, it is true magic, and the person doing it is utterly transported by their ability to project vis visual beauty, but it appears to have no use other than entertainment of oneself and others. But eventually, when it is integrated as a cultural mode, I think it will be, it is what telepathy will be. Telepathy will not be hearing other people's thoughts in your head. Telepathy will be when you switch into the language that lets people see what you mean. It'll be the see what I mean language. And I think that uh, the psilocybin from the very beginning was catalyzing the language centers. And that in fact, the kind of language I'm speaking to you right now is a prototypic type of this eventual development in human organization. And that this is the thing that makes humans unique is this ability to make small mouth noises which are arbitrarily encoded with conventionally agreed upon meanings, which allows us then a vast control of a previously invisible uh, linguistic space. And it's in that linguistic space that we have erected our cathedrals and conducted our pogroms and gone about all our uh, forms of business. And uh, and becoming aware of this, of language as a thing to journey into and language as a thing to avoid the pitfalls of. To be, you know, the Buddhists say, awareness of awareness. Maybe it's easier if one thinks of it as awareness of language. You know. I wanted to um, pursue this thing of the, the visual language because they'll have their mouth open and there will literally be these beautiful things coming out of their mouth with flowers and they interpreted this flowery speech but perhaps uh, they were in fact doing what you're talking about. Oh. Well they don't interpret it as flowery speech, they, they call it that. But yes, I think that's what it must have been. This is all very puzzling to me and if anybody knows, if anybody is an acoustics person or I don't know what's going on exactly, but the question of how, what is voice and what can you do with self-generated sound? How neutral is it to your own organism? In other words, uh, any of you who read The Invisible Landscape, the theory in there is that you take a certain drug, a certain plant, and you hear an interiorized tone which is not a psychological phenomenon, but rather it is actually the electron spin resonance of this highly biodynamic molecules by the millions entering into the synaptic cleft and competing with the endogenous uh, uh, transmitter there for uptake. And that this mm, is molecularly real and hence can be treated as a, manipul a variable to be manipulated with the input of other kinds of sound, such as sound which cancels it or sound which uh, reinforces it to then manipulate these molecules in, in one's body. And this is, uh, this is really, I think, the frontier of shamanism worldwide that everybody is trying to figure out how far you can go with sound and what you can do with it and also how dangerous is this? How permanent can some of these brain changes be? And what is the mechanism? You know, is the electron spin resonance thing pretty close to it or is that just a myth and that an entirely different set of coupling mechanisms are, are making that happen. But all of the ayahuasca shaman are great hummers and great controllers of their voice. And uh, you know they do operate on your body with light and sound. And there are sounds which can slice into your body. And, uh, and it seems to me this is where experiential and experimental work with these things should concentrate to try and understand just how much of humanness can we take control of? How bound in are we? What do these special abilities mean? And, uh, and uh, what traditions, if any, have anticipated them?